Hello, everyone. I'm David. I'm from Damasuka out here in Missouri, and uh, we're just waiting for a few more people to join us on this Eightfold Path series uh, with Delson Armstrong, who's going to be coming to us from uh, Mumbai, India, where it's kind of late at night. Um, I have with me um, Alan uh, McClinock, McClennan, McClennan. I get you guys confused. Um, <laughs> from uh, you're in Denver, right, Callan? Yeah, or Boulder, Colorado. So he wanted to give us a little rundown on a new organization that's forming around TWIM, and um, what's going to be happening. Callan, you want to talk about that? Looks like most people yeah, yeah. come in now. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you, David. I just wanted to say we're delighted to welcome all of you to the first of this series of talks on the Noble Eightfold Path under the new joint venture of freedom of mind uh, combined with Damasuka. And I'll just give a quick introduction. My name's Callan, and I'm one of the founders of Freedom of Mind, which is now officially a registered 501c non 501c3 nonprofit that we created to help support teachers like Delson continue sharing the meditation practice. And our goals are to offer a bunch of free resources to assist people in their meditation journey. We'll be offering uh, Zoom talks like today and courses in addition to books, and we have intentions to offer both online and physical retreats in the very near future. And uh, we're still in the earliest stages of development, but we plan to have a website up and running by the end of the year, and we'll be sure to keep everyone updated through the Damasuka email list with any announcements about future talks and events. And uh, just a final note is that if you feel supported or if you feel moved to support Delson or this new venture of freedom of mind in any way, please feel free to reach out to web at freedomofmind.foundation. I'll provide that email in the chat. And then additionally, Damasuka is currently accepting donations on our behalf on the Sundays in which these talks will be held. And I just want to thank you all so much for your support. And we really look forward to seeing you all at future events in the in the coming months and years. Okay, thank you, uh, Callan. Give it a minute or two more. So this is going to be a series of talks that go on uh, into April and uh, talking about all the aspects of the Eightfold Path, uh, just starting at number one. And uh, I think uh, I think we can get started. Um, oh, we got one more. All right, so here's uh, Delson. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight him for you. Delson, you have the have the screen. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's all good to uh, see you all. Well, I don't know most of you. Are, I don't probably know, but in any case, it's good to see you all. Um, so I'm going to start on. The Eightfold Path, and I want to explain to you why we want to do the Eightfold Path as a study series. <clears throat> so the Eightfold Path is actually the fourth noble truth. Um, when we talk about the four noble truths that the Buddha has talked about, he said that there is suffering, right? And there are causes and conditions for that suffering. That's the second noble truth. There is a cessation of suffering, and there is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So suffering in of itself can be a whole topic, a whole discussion or series of discussions, because he's divided up suffering into different facets and different variants. When we talk about the uh, causes and conditions for suffering, we can discuss dependent origination, which we've done in the past, and we've talked about it uh, uh, quite often in the retreats and in the symposium and so on. And then the cessation of suffering essentially is nirodha, right? And so when we talk about nirodha, nirodha means it can mean the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. But here we're talking about dukkha nirodha, which is the cessation of suffering. And so this can be synonymous with uh, nibbana, the experience of nibbana. So what is nibbana? Nibbana is essentially the cessation of greed, hatred, and delusion, the seeds of suffering. These are the roots that cause the mind to create all kinds of mental proliferation, that create all kinds of craving, different types of craving, clinging, 
becoming and then finally the birth of suffering birth of action and then suffering so when we look at nibbana what we're saying is it is the it's the unwinding of that process every time the mind experiences the world if it doesn't have the tools necessary essentially the eightfold path uh, and that is synonymous with right effort or encapsulated in right effort in the six r's if we don't have that then the mind will continue to create suffering through craving clinging and being and birth of new action and so it succumbs to old karma karmic choices and intentions that were done through the mode of craving and which leads to further craving which leads to further suffering which leads to further karma so the idea here is to unwind all of that unwind all of that and the way we do that is to recognize that there is something arising in the form of craving there's a tension or tightness in the head and in the body or that we see that there is this craving for becoming happening or that there is this attachment to an outcome happening. We recognize that, right? In the meditation, we recognize any of the hindrances. And so those hindrances are also suffering. We recognize that, we release our attention from that. It's the attention to those hindrances or to that aspect of suffering that keeps it going, that perpetuates it. So we take away that attention by releasing our mind's attention from it, bringing it back to the mind and body and then relaxing and letting go of any type of intention. The moment we do that, we experience the mundane form of Nibbana. And then we come back to the smile, which is to generate a wholesome object, a wholesome uh, mind object. And then from that, we continue with our object of meditation, primarily loving kindness, but it can be compassion. It could even be the breath. It could be whatever it is that you're taking as your object of meditation. And then we repeat whenever necessary. So this process of the six R's is essentially right effort. And the right effort that we're talking about is really the heart of the Eightfold Path. So you'll notice in the schedule that we have, we're not really going to discuss right effort because it is in, it's encapsulated in the eightfold. It's in, it's an encapsulation of the eightfold path, but it's also interwoven through the entire eightfold path, and you'll see how. So that comes to, you know, the eightfold path as being the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So when the Buddha talked about the middle way in his first discourse, his very first discourse at Sarnath, at the Deer Park. He spoke to the first five disciples and he said that there is a middle way. There is the way of excess. There is the way of uh, indulgence. And that does not lead to anything noble. And then there is the way of asceticism. There is the way of causing pain and tension and suffering in the mind and body with the idea that that's going to lead us out of suffering. So what he said was neither of these two extremes is going to take us to where we want, which is ultimately the freedom of mind, ultimately cheto vimuti, ultimately freedom from the bondage of samsara, liberation. And so that's when he introduces in this discourse, the Eightfold Path. So it's called the Noble Eightfold Path because it is what leads one to becoming noble. A noble person is somebody who is awakened, who's reached at least the first level of awakening, right? And, and so on. So the first factor of the Eightfold Path is what we're going to discuss today. That is Samaditi. So Samaditi is generally translated as right view. But I want to first uh, bring an understanding to this word sama, because some translations have it as right, some have it as proper, and so on. So sama, which is in Pali, comes from the Sanskrit samyak. And samyak, depending upon the context, can mean that which is proper, 
that which is, um, you know, fit to follow, that which is essentially effective in the sense that it is effective for leading you towards Nibbana. But even the word right, when we use the word right, it's actually a um, not only an ethical way of looking at it, that is to say it's a wholesome path. When we say right view, it's a wholesome view. When we say right intention, it's a wholesome intention and so on. But if you go back to the root of the word right, that too comes from a word called dritta in Pali and Sanskrit. Dritta, that's R-T-A. Dritta means that which is harmonious, that which is in harmony with the cosmic order, that which aligns with Nibbana, that which aligns with what is required to experience and attain Nibbana. So when once you have this context, then you understand that the Eightfold Path is essentially a blueprint. It's a guideline. It is the way leading to Nibbana. And so when we talk about samaditi, right? So now the word diti, which is the Pali or drishti, that can mean to gaze at something, that could mean view, that can mean vision, to look out at something, a perspective, whatever you want to uh, call it. But essentially, when we say right view, we're talking about two levels. So when we're going to explore, explore each of these different facets of the Eightfold Path, we're going to be looking at it at two levels. One is the mundane level, and the second is the super mundane level. The mundane level is essentially when you start out on the path, there are certain things that are required for you to actually have that mundane right view. And these elements actually allow for a more wholesome state of mind. It's actually psychologically beneficial to have these different facets of mundane right view when you start out on the path. And then that will take you ultimately to the super mundane right view. So I'm going to use Majjhima Nikaya 117, Majjhima Nikaya 117 as my source material. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to pick out uh, certain elements from there to discuss each of these different facets. And so this is Majjhima Nikaya 117, the great 40. So here's the mundane right view. So here the Buddha says, and what bhikkhus is right view that is affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. There is what is given and what is offered and what is sacrificed. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There are in the world good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. This is right view affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. So what does he mean by this? Affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. So when he says affected by the taints, he's talking about the asavas. So we have three primary asavas. Sometimes they're uh, listed as four, but they're actually three. So the first asava is the asava of ignorance. The second asava is the asava of becoming. And the third is the asava of craving, sensual craving. So affected by these, in other words, you haven't actually rooted out any of the asavas yet. There is still sensual craving. There is still some level of desire for becoming. There is still some level of ignorance. Although you have been introduced to the Eightfold Path, although you've been introduced to the Four Noble Truths and the Dhamma and so on, there is work to be done. Because you can't just say, I know it, and now it's done. A certain level of ignorance is gone once you understand the Four Noble Truths. But when you start applying them, and you actually root out the ignorance, then that particular asava is gone. But it happens in a certain order as well. It, first, you let go of any kind of sensual craving. 
then you let go of the desire for existence, the desire for becoming something, right? These are the habitual tendencies. These are the different ways that the mind says, I want to be so-and-so, even wanting to be a great meditator. It's a great aspiration to have, but becoming obsessed by it, right? Becoming obsessed by having a certain level of achievement, that can also be the desire for a certain type of existence. And then finally, ignorance itself. When we talk about ignorance, we're really talking about not knowing, not understanding, and not applying the Four Noble Truths in every moment. So the best way of looking at ignorance is that it is a lack of mindfulness, a lack of mindfulness of the Dhamma, a lack of mindfulness of the Four Noble Truths, a lack of mindfulness of the moment in general. So this is what it means when it is affected by the taints. So there's work to be done. Partaking, partaking of merit. In other words, it's still you're still producing karma. You're still producing effects of various actions. So what this means is when the mind is free from all craving, free from all desire for any kind of renewed existence, free from all ignorance, then any of the links in dependent origination that start from craving onwards disappear for, for that particular mind. That is the mind without craving. That is the mind of somebody who is fully liberated. And when that mind is fully liberated, they are still beckoning to the call of previous karma, but they're not producing any new karma. Therefore, they're not partaking of any merits. They're not partaking of any effects of good or bad actions taken prior or continuously being taken because they, are, they, are, they have let go of any kind of fuel for new karma. But any kind of old karma that arises, arises in the form of being made contact through the sixth sense basis. So experiencing a pleasurable feeling, experiencing a painful feeling, it's all karma. It's all a result of previous actions that were taken prior to full awakening. In other words, these actions were rooted in an intention that was guided by craving. These actions were motivated by craving, motivated by the desire for existence, the, the sensual desire, motivated by ignorance, or fueled by ignorance, right? So all of that is now having to come through at some point or another, if the causes and conditions are right. But for the arahat, for somebody who is fully liberated, those actions or the effects of those actions stop right there and then in terms of the experience, in terms of the feeling. Now there's no identification process with that action. There's no identity in relation to the effect of those previous actions. And therefore, there is no more fuel, right? So that, that kind of partaking of merit is essentially somebody who hasn't let go fully, somebody who still has work to be done. And then finally, it says, ripening in the acquisitions. So when we say ripening in the acquisitions, or acquisitions here, can be another word for clinging, right? So when we talk about clinging, we talk about four different types of clinging, but essentially when we say clinging, we're saying there's still ripening in the identification process with even right view, right? So that means that the mind says that I am the one who has right view. This right view is mine. I am a good meditator. I'm a good follower of the Eightfold Path and so on and so forth. The identity is what ripens in acquisitions. And this identity then gives rise to further acquisitions and so on. So now we'll get into the mundane right view. There is what is given and what is offered and what is sacrificed. So when we say offered and sacrificed, these can be used interchangeably depending upon the context. But let's go back to given. Given here means dana. Right, something that is given. This means the exercising of generosity. So 
you know, when we give to another person, we are exercising generosity. The Buddha has stated that if you understood the significance, the vitality, the importance of generosity, if you understood how much it provides you in terms of what you get back when you exercise generosity, you would not hesitate. You would not waste a moment to share whatever it is that you have. Every meal that you have, you would want to share something of your meal with another person. That is the level of importance that is given to generosity. And when we talk about generosity, there are different ways of being generous. We can offer money, but that's a very basic kind of generosity. We can offer food, we can offer shelter, we can offer medicines, we can offer clothing. But the fundamental level of generosity is offering our loving kindness, being generous with our goodwill towards others, being generous with our compassion, being generous with it, with our empathetic joy, being generous with our equanimity and patience. And it all starts with the smile. You know, that is the importance that's given here in this practice of the six R's. The relax and then the re-smile. Every time you smile, you come back to the present moment. Every time you smile, you bring greater awareness. You bring greater mindfulness. And every time you share your smile with another person, every time you share a good joke with another person, every time you uplift another person's heart, every time you laugh with another person, you make somebody laugh, you are being generous. Right? It's as simple as that. When you talk about what is offered and what is sacrificed. So let's just take the word offer. Here we're really specifically talking about what is offered to the community. That is the Sangha and primarily the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis. Because what is offered to the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis is seen as being offered to the entire Sangha. Right? That's what the Buddha has said. He has said that when you offer to me as the Buddha, or you offer to any of the bhikkhus, you are offering to the entire Sangha. And that is the merit that you're receiving by offering to the Sangha. Now, there, there is another sutta which talks about the different levels of offering. It talks about offering to somebody outside of the Dhamma. It talks about offering to animals. It talks about offering to even people who aren't following the precepts. There is still something... Uh, received in terms of merit. And then, of course, in the giving, there is a purification of that process through one who is giving, in the mind of one who is given and giving, and in the mind of one who is receiving. But when we offer to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, what we're doing is we're having an opportunity to essentially transfer that merit to our loved ones, and especially to those who have passed on. So, you know, in different parts of Asia, you'll see this. For example, when I was in Cambodia, there was, there is this um, celebration called Chunbun, Chun, Chunbun. And in there, it's essentially, you know, all the lay people going to the monasteries and offering food, offering shelter, uh, offering shelter, offering robes, offering even money. And what they're doing is in this offering, they are essentially praying that may the merit of this offering go to my loved ones who have passed on. And so you will see in a lot of um, stories in the Petavatu, for example, the Petavatu is a story of the hungry ghosts. It talks about how if somebody is a hungry ghost, somebody who has no ability to do anything in terms of producing new actions because they are beholden to the effects of their previous actions from past lives, but they have no ability to even generate any good actions that can cause them to experience a higher level of rebirth. They are essentially helpless, right? So they have to wait until many, many, many thousands of years, even hundreds of thousands of years sometimes, but generally thousands to ten thousands of years, to let that karma burn out. And then whatever good karma is there standing in line, 
is accrued and that provides them the ability to go into a new higher uh, rebirth. But there is a way out of that that's a little faster, a little quicker. And what that is, is essentially the hungry ghost, their relatives who are still alive in the human realm, what they will do is they will offer to the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis, and they will then dedicate that merit to those relatives. Now, you know, not everybody knows where their relatives are. Some might be devas, some might be in another life, uh, in the human existence, they might be hungry ghosts, they might be whatever they are. But in offering to the monks, uh, to the bhikkhu sangha, and then transferring that merit, merit that dedicating that merit, if there are those who are in the hungry ghost realm, they will receive that and they will have a better opportunity, a faster opportunity to get out of there and then go into possibly a human realm or even the Deva Loka. So this is the understanding of what is offered. When we say what is sacrificed, so the word sacrificed in Pali, it comes from the word yitta. And in Pali, yitta comes from the Sanskrit yajati, right? Yajati means uh, a yagya. And a yagya is essentially a fire sacrifice. It's oblations. So the idea here is certain kinds of ceremonies, certain kinds of rituals, certain kinds of offerings that we do in terms of praying to the Buddha, right? We don't actually pray to the Buddha, but what we're doing is we're offering our, you know, our goodwill to everybody. And we're saying and accepting that there was somebody known as the Buddha who essentially founded this path. And now we are offering our thanks. We are offering our gratitude for that. But in some parts of Asia, you'll also see what's known as Dhatu Puja. It's called Dhatu Puja. And what that is, is they will take the relics of the Buddha or they'll take relics of uh, a supposed arahat or uh, a monk or whoever it is. But essentially it would be the Buddha or a supposed arahat. And they will do what's known as Dhatu Puja. And that's essentially a ceremony and a ritual that is, you know, like kind of like an oblation. So what that means is if somebody starts out on the path and they are new to the path and they haven't really acquired right view yet in terms of the experience of it, and they still pray to the devas or they still do certain kinds of ceremonies, maybe they light candles or they light uh, you know, lamps in the temples or whatever it is, it's fine, completely fine. The idea here is that we're not saying that a person needs to pray. We're not saying a person needs to be uh, worshiping something. What we're saying is it's the attitude that it's brought up, is brought out by a person when they do these kinds of things. And that's essentially the beginning of some kind of faith, right? Some kind of um, willingness to try and see for oneself what this path is all about. So the ability to have uh, faith in something is then essentially uh, transformed into experiential confidence when we walk this path. So I would say it's it's better to believe in something than not at all, because it gives you a certain level of gladness in the mind. It gives you uh, a feeling of being uplifted. You know, there is a, a famous... Um, well, he's a professor, a neuroscience professor, let's say. His name is Robert Sapolsky. He talks about how, you know, atheists uh, are pro probably one of the most depressed people on this planet because they have nothing to believe in. But people who have a certain kind of belief system, people who believe in anything, doesn't mean that they have blind faith necessarily. It doesn't mean that they're gullible, but they have a certain level of faith in something. It actually is beneficial and healthy for them from a neuroscientific perspective. So when somebody has even that basic level of some kind of belief in something outside of ourselves, whether you want to call them the devas or God or whatever it is, that might be there. And once it's there and you start walking the path, you see that that faith starts to renew itself into faith in the Dhamma and the Sangha, the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. 
And that faith is not something where we have to say we have to believe in something, we have to subscribe to an idea or whatever. The Buddha has always said, see for yourself, see and experiment and see for yourself by walking the path. Once you walk the path, then you have established the experiential confidence. So this is the understanding of what is sacrifice. It's the idea that there is some belief in a world outside, and we'll get to that as well. And that in that world outside, there are other beings and so on. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. So this is essentially karma. When we talk about karma, you know, there is a whole level of complexity about karma because there is karma, which means the intention to do something. There's karma in terms of the effect of that intention. And there's karma, which is just pure action, right? That's not motivated by craving. But there is fruit and result of good and bad actions. This is also very important, psychologically speaking, because if you don't have this understanding, then whatever you do, you know, it's a very nihilistic way of looking at the world. You will say that whatever I do has no meaning. Whatever I'm thinking, whatever I'm saying, whatever I'm doing has no meaning. So it doesn't matter if I, you know, um, lie. It doesn't matter if I cheat. It doesn't matter if I, you know, steal. It doesn't matter if I kill because there's no result of any good and bad actions. In fact, this is one of the wrong views that the Buddha has pointed out. And in that wrong view, it has, it's been our world and roll it up into one mass of flesh. And I was to cut that mass of flesh up. There would be no result from that. But it, actually, we do see in our world and in our experience of the world that our actions do have consequences. Our actions that are rooted in certain kinds of intentions have consequences. And therefore, what I say, what I do, what I think about has a direct effect in the future. It might not happen immediately, but it could happen 10 years down the road. It could happen in another life. It could happen in a life that's 10 lives you know, down the road. doesn't matter. But what the Buddha is saying here is that all of our actions have some kind of consequence, good, bad, or indifferent. So when you have this understanding of karma, then you become more mindful of your intentions. You become more mindful of the kinds of words that you use. You become more mindful in your interactions with beings around you. And so the idea is if you see that there is consequences to your actions, then you will prevent yourself from harming other individuals, harming other beings. Because that can have a direct result on your future. You may be having to face that same kind of treatment down the road. And so that's where the understanding of the precepts comes to place, right? So the idea that I will not cause harm to other living beings because I don't want to be harmed. I don't want to lie to other beings because I don't want to be lied to. Right? I don't want to have any kind of sensual misconduct because I don't want people to act in a way that is going to disturb me. So in other words, when we talk about sensual, sexual or sensual misconduct, it's the pursuit of sensual pleasures through the making the other precepts. Or I don't want uh, people to steal from me, so I will not steal. So the idea is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the understanding of there is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. Now, this is a very interesting statement. It can mean that there is this world that we experience in terms of this existence and that there are other layers of existence. From a cosmological standpoint, when we talk about the Indian cosmology, and particularly Buddhist cosmology, there are many different levels of existence. There are layers to those different realms, right? So we have, you know, the six central heavens above us. There is 
the four Brahma Lokas, but within those four Brahma Lokas, there are three subdivisions. There are the four Arupa Lokas, and then below us is the animal realm, the hungry ghost realm, the Niraya or the hell realms. And within those hell realms, there are different subsets depending upon the crime and punishment and so on. But that's something that not everybody can necessarily subscribe to because they haven't seen it for themselves. And so we don't need to subscribe to it. We don't need to blindly follow that this is the case. But what we can say is that there is something beyond just our limited human understanding that we can't see, that we cannot interpret even. Because this world that we have is defined by the matrix of our five physical sense bases, right? Everything we see through the eyes, everything we hear through the ears, everything we smell and taste, every, everything that we feel through the body, all of that is essentially different kinds of sensory data points, right? The eyes pick up photons, the ears pick up vibrations, the nose picks up odor molecules, the tongue picks up taste molecules, the body picks up different kinds of variations in heat and temperature and vibration internally and externally. And then that is interpreted as perception, as I'm seeing the color red, or I'm seeing the color blue, or I'm hearing Beethoven's fifth, or I'm smelling this particular perfume, or I'm tasting this curry, or I feel hot, or I feel cold, or I feel a stomach ache going, or I feel a headache. All of these are essentially different sensory data points. And this is the world that is defined by those sense bases. We cannot see anything outside of it for the, for the time being, unless we're able to cultivate extrasensory perception. And that happens through the cultivation of various different kinds of psychic faculties. And that can happen through the attainment of the jhanas and understanding how the jhanas happen and so on. But what is the other world that we're talking about? The other world, yes, it can be outside of the scope of our limited sensory experiences, but the other world can also be the mind itself and primarily the super mundane experience of the mind. What does that mean? So we can say that this world is the mundane. This world is right here, right now through our sense bases. But the other world is super mundane. It is elevated. It is beyond our sense basis. And that is the experience of jhanas. So the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, and then the arupa jhanas or the ayatanas can be understood as the super mundane. That is beyond just the sense base experiences. And then the ultimate super mundane, so to speak, would be the experience of nibbana itself. So there is this world and the other world. There is this world that I'm experiencing now through my sense bases, but there's a possibility of transcending this world through meditation, through the process of collectedness and going into these high states of experience, these altered states in the sense that they are altered because they're not, they're not based in any kind of thought. They're not based in any kind of thinking, right? Initially, in the first jhana, when we talk about the first jhana, we have thinking and examining thought to the point that we bring up an object and then we sustain our attention on it. But immediately after that, we let go of that and then we're cruising through in the second jhana, the third and the fourth. And now we're experiencing that which is super mundane. And so therefore, this is the right view affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. This is all part of the mundane. Now we'll talk about the super mundane right view. Before I continue with this, this particular passage is different uh, in the sense that usually when we talk about the super mundane right view, what we're saying is it comes about at stream entry. It comes about when somebody experiences the first level of awakening. And now they have established experiential confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. They've let go of any kind of wrong view. And they've let go of any kind of uh, belief in rites and rituals with the idea that they will take you to Nibbana. 
in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, there is a passage where Ananda asks the Buddha, when you are gone, because he's already announced that he's going to be going in three months, he's going to be attaining Parinibbana. So Ananda says, how are we to know? How are we to see? How are we to understand when somebody experiences stream entry? It's very interesting because the Buddha doesn't talk about letting go of wrong views, although it is there. He doesn't talk about letting go of attachments to rites and rituals or the idea that they'll take you to Nibbana, although it's there. But he specifically points out the mirror of the Dhamma, Ananda, is to see if someone has total conviction and confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So what does it mean when we say conviction in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha? First and foremost, we're talking about we're talking about the, the faith in the Buddha, the faith in the idea that there was somebody there who experienced for themselves Nibbana and brought up the ability or showed the way how to experience that Nibbana. When we talk about the Dhamma, the Dhamma itself is essentially understanding dependent origination and following the Eightfold Path. And when we talk about the Sangha, the Sangha is essentially the community of people that you have who are practicing the same thing you are. So that's the Bhikkhu Sangha and the Bhikkhuni Sangha. That's the Arya Sangha, that is the Sangha of those beings who have experienced the levels of awakening. And then there is the Sangha that is you know, the entire Sangha of those who follow the Buddha's, the Buddha's ways. So before I go on, looks like there's some other ones that I've skipped here. So then there is mother and father. So when we say there is mother and father, what the Buddha is saying is we have to understand and acknowledge the people that took care of us. It doesn't necessarily have to be our biological parents, it could be people who brought us up. It could be our caregivers. It could be, you know, our cousins who might have brought us up. It could be our aunts and uncles. It could be our grandparents. It could be whoever it was. But the idea is that we cannot return the debt that our parents gave us. Even if our parents were not as loving as we wanted them to be, even if they were not as accepting as maybe we wanted them to be. The fact is they brought us into this world and bringing us into this world allows us the potential to experience Nibbana. And for that alone, we can have some level of gratitude. And then we acknowledge all of those people who have taken care of us as we've grown up so that we understand how the world functions. And perhaps, and perhaps not, they've introduced us to the Dhamma whether or not they have, we still acknowledge that they were able to bring us up into this world to a certain point so that we do come to the Dhamma. And then finally, well, there's a couple of things here. It says, there are beings who are reborn spontaneously. So when we say there are beings who are reborn spontaneously, we're saying that rebirth, there's a potential for rebirth. Now, this is also in alignment with what I said earlier about this world and the other. It's not like we have to blindly believe that there is rebirth. We should have a level of openness to say that potentially there could be rebirth. But as we start to experience the Dhamma for ourselves, what we start to see is, in fact, rebirth is happening at every moment. Because what we talk about as consciousness is not one consciousness that is there pervasive throughout. It is the arising and passing away of individual consciousnesses, individual sense-based consciousnesses. Even the life that we have in this world or in this existence, in this particular birth, is impermanent. It arises and passes away. There is, in that sense, what is known as the Jivat Indriya, which is the life faculty. And that could be understood as a level of consciousness, consciousness that comes into existence when it joins with the embryo, right? The mother and father join together. And then there is the Gandamba, that is the descending consciousness that then gives life to that particular biological or organic material. 
And so this consciousness then gives life to the series of the arising and passing away of sense-based consciousnesses. But when that being dies, that consciousness too departs. It's not the same consciousness. It goes through layers and layers of changes. And that's happening in every moment. So if we start to see it in this way, and then we finally start to experience it in this way, then we say there's actually spontaneous rebirth. There is the idea that even within the understanding of rebirth, that there might be a interval. There might be a what's known as a antra bhava. So that's basically kind of like a purgatory or a intermediate between this world or this life and the next life. But all of that actually is happening at the level of mind. You think about our own identities, the identities that we've built up they are spontaneously generated. They spontaneously arise and pass away. They continue to change all the time. You're not the same person you were, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago or three years ago or a year ago. You're not the same person you were six months ago, a month ago, a week ago. You're not even the same person you were when this talk started because new information potentially has been given to you. And now your identity chooses to take it or not to take it. But in, in essence, your consciousness continues to arise and pass away. So this is what is meant by there are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There is no pause between the arising of one consciousness and the arising of the next consciousness, or let's say the passing away of one consciousness and the arising of the next consciousness. It is seamless. It happens like that. And then finally, part of the mundane right views, there are in the world good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. So this is essentially talking about the Buddha and Arhats, essentially people who have walked the path for themselves done the work, done what had to be done, experienced for themselves Nibbana, and walked the path to the end. So doing so, they can actually guide others. They can say that this is the way I have done it. This is the way that I have learned it. And so try and see for yourself. So when we acknowledge that and we say indeed that there are teachers, there are guides, maybe they haven't walked the entire path, but there are still teachers and guides who have walked some of the path, who know some of the map. And so when we acknowledge that, then we can just follow in their instruction and then start to practically apply it. And we will see for ourselves that it, whether it works or not. Now, I'll come back to the super mundane right view. I was talking about how that really is the understanding of right view as being experiential confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And that's the way it's understood in most suttas and primarily the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. It's not just, I know that there is suffering. I know that there is, you know, causes and conditions for the suffering. I know that there's a way out of the suffering. I know that there is a path that, that leads to the end of the suffering. It's not just, I know this by rote. I know this in my mind. It's more that I have applied the Four Noble Truths and therefore I'm able to see the Four Noble Truths and utilize the Four Noble Truths for whatever is arising. So the ultimate understanding of right view, therefore, is that you fully understand what suffering is. You fully abandon all of the different causes and conditions for that suffering. You fully realize the end of that suffering, which is Nibbana. And you fully develop, cultivate, and perfect the way leading to that end of suffering, which is the Eightfold Path. But as I said earlier, in this particular sutta, it's a little different. And this is what the Buddha says. And what bhikkhus is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path, the wisdom the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of states enlightenment factor, the path factor of right view in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. 
This is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. So this is the super mundane right view. It is noble because it is being exercised by somebody who is a stream enter and above. It can be taintless because it's being exercised automatically, spontaneously by somebody who is an arahat. It's super mundane because it transcends the, the rebirth into future existences. It transcends all the way towards Nibbana. So these factors, the wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, and the power of wisdom. What does it mean when we say wisdom? So when we say wisdom, we're talking about wisdom as the understanding of the Four Noble Truths, but it's also the understanding of dependent origination. And not just the understanding, it's the application, the realization, the experiencing, the, the observing of dependent origination. When you experience Nibbana, what happens is the mind makes contact with the Nibbana element. And when the mind makes contact with the Nibbana element, that that contact is said to be empty, empty of any kind of self. It's undirected because there is no um, direction. There is no desire. And it's said to be um, signless because it's not an object that is being taken. Nibbana cannot be considered as an object, even though we say there is this idea of the Nibbana element. It's just it's just words that we're using to specify something. But in reality, it's this experience that is beyond any condition. It is the absolute. It is the unconditioned experience. And in that unconditioned experience, from that, there arises this contact, which gives rise to feeling. That feeling is conditioned by that unconditioned contact. And that feeling then can give rise to seeing the links of dependent origination. Indeed, when you see the feeling or experience the feeling and you start to see the other links in whatever way you are, that is basically a projection of your mind's ability to see it in whatever way it sees it. It doesn't matter how you see it. What matters is your mindfulness is so sharp that you're able to see, in fact, that there is no person here. There is no self here that is guiding this whole process. It is all a series of impersonal experiences, impersonal input, impersonal processes that are happening. And when you see that, that's when you develop the wisdom. That's when you touch upon wisdom. That is wisdom. And when we talk about the faculty of wisdom and the power of wisdom, so the faculty of wisdom is the ability to discern between what is wholesome and unwholesome the ability to understand what is the path leading to Nibbana and what is not the path leading to Nibbana. And the power of wisdom is the immediate ability to use your intuition. So another way of looking at wisdom is that, yes, it comes from the word panya, which means insight. But wisdom here can also be intuition. And when we talk about intuition, that is the ability to spontaneously know what needs to be done in that moment, and that is appropriate for that moment. It is not preconceived. It is not conditioned. It just arises because that mind, which is now taintless, which means it has experienced full awakening, that mind is functioning all the time from intuition. And the way to develop your intuition is to see for yourself how your mind works, right? You can exercise your intuition by seeing how the mind works by giving it a question. Maybe you have a problem that you're trying to solve. Maybe there's decisions that you need to make, certain choices that you need to make. But that part of the mind that is, let's say, the thinking mind, the mind that is conditioned, the mind that is you know, still rooted in some level of ignorance, that is still having ch uh, chitter chatter, that is still restless, is trying to deal with the situation in a way that is not necessarily fully effective, right? It can use all kinds of analysis. It can use all kinds of logic to come to some kind of rational conclusion. But that's a limitation or that is limited. When you use intuition, it bypasses all of that. Intuition is essentially surrendering the mind to the moment, surrendering the mind to the synchronicity of what is around you. 
of what is available. So essentially, when you quieten the mind, when the mind becomes completely quiet and the heart is awake, the heart is open, at that point in time, there is intuition. So when you say the heart, what we're saying is the ability to feel, not in terms of feeling, but the ability to actually pick up on messages. And those messages aren't necessarily coming from some universe or God or whatever. These messages that come up in the form of thoughts, that can come up in the form of pictures or ideas or even visions, whatever they are, are guiding the mind to the synchronicities that it can experience and that is appropriate for the solutions that are required in that. So this is intuition. This is the ability to exercise intuition. So you can start off small. You can start off very mundane. You can say, okay, I have these choices to make. Either I do this or do that, but I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to quieten my mind. I'm going to present that mind with the choices and I'm going to let it go. And you just walk away from it. And all of a sudden, when you least expect it, this is the very important thing to understand. The, when you least expect it, in other words, when there is no craving involved, when there is no attachment to an outcome involved, when there is no expectations involved, then the true answer will come to you and it will hit you like a eureka moment. And when you take that choice, when you make that decision, it might not be the decision you personally want to make, but it will be the decision that is effective and appropriate for the situation. And it ultimately takes you you know, direction that leads you towards the Dhamma, leads you towards, you know, right intention, right speech, right action, and so on and so forth, which we'll explore later. So the mind that is able to exercise the Eightfold Path in every moment is exercising the faculty of wisdom, right? So they have possessed some level of wisdom in seeing for themselves how this is an impersonal process when they see the links of dependent origination. But then they start to exercise. In other words, they utilize right effort. They utilize right mindfulness. They become mindful of the Dhamma in every moment. They understand what is going on. When they do that, they are open. They are surrendering to the moment. They are taking refuge in the moment. When they do that, then the power of wisdom cultivates and then it becomes automatic. And that power of wisdom is intuition, spontaneous intuition. And that is the mind of one who is fully awakened, complete spontaneity, right? Spontaneity, not in the sense that, you know, I'm going to do this today or all of a sudden I change my mind and I'm going to do this instead. It's more of like there is no required thinking need it because that mind functions automatically from the eightfold path so whatever that mind does it will always be rooted in the eightfold path it will always be rooted in the dhamma and therefore it won't produce new karma it won't produce any new rebirth any potential for further existence it will just stop right there and then but it will exercise right speech right action right livelihood in a way that is appropriate right it might say that mind might say i don't need to speak right now or these are the words i have to say in this particular order for people to understand what needs to be done the buddha obviously was a master at that right he understood and he surveyed the minds and he was able to see what is required and then use the right exposition right usage of words to penetrate to the innermost core of their minds. Oftentimes you'll see in the suttas where it starts off where the Buddha is, uh, you know, he might be going out for alms round and he says it's too early for alms round. And he, maybe he sits down and meditates. And then all of a sudden, like he gets a thought, it says a thought occurred to him that maybe I should go to this place or maybe I should go see the Sakyans or the Mullins or whoever it is. And then he goes there and it's appropriate for him to go there because it was needed for that moment or needed for that time so that he could give a discourse or so that he could interact with them and help liberate people. So this is the power of wisdom. The investigate, investigation of states, enlightenment factor. This is called, or in Pali, this is called Dhamma Vichaya. 
Dhamma, of course, are the phenomena, the states. Vichaya here is to investigate. But the word investigate, you know, it denotes the idea that we have to rationalize, we have to analyze, we have to think about it, we have to, you know, we have to penetrate by continuously analyzing. But that's not how we're doing it. The way I would look at it is investigation of states is really the understanding of what is happening in every given moment, right? So this is dependent upon the component or the preceding enlightenment factor, which is mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to the other. Mindfulness comes from the word sati. Sati comes from the word smriti, which means to remember. What are we remembering? We're remembering the Dhamma in every moment. We're remembering to see where is my mind in this moment? Is my mind in a wholesome state or is my mind thinking and proliferating all of these different kinds of ideas? Is my mind content in this moment or is my mind worrying and restless and anxious about what's going to happen, right? So that ability to see and discern, so another word for it is discernment of what states are present in the mind is also part of this super mundane right view. And the path factor of right view in one whose mind is noble. So one whose mind is noble would be somebody who is a stream enterer with fruition, whose mind is taintless, somebody who is an arahat, who possesses the noble path, right? Somebody who is walking the path and one who is developing the noble path. So this could be somebody who is a faith follower, somebody who is a Dhamma follower, somebody who, um, you know, is walking the path but hasn't yet experienced stream entry. But the fact is they're starting to utilize the different aspects of the Eightfold Path, Right? They're starting to utilize right effort. They're starting to utilize mindfulness and starting to see for themselves how mind works. So all of these are factors of the mundane right view. Therefore, this is the view or this is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. So I'm going to stop there, give everybody a minute to collect themselves, and then you can ask whatever questions you want. So if you've got a question, um, just say unmute yourself and go for it. Hello. Hello. <laughs> hey. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, David. Thank you. Hey, Mario. Hello. Um, I have a question regarding um, the mundane right view on rebirth. I have a friend that uh, very atheistic, right? But then suddenly through watching YouTube, right? He began to listen stuff about near-death near death experiences. And for the first time in his life, maybe, he started to contemplate the possibility of something like that, right? Never before had he like thought about the possibility of there being rebirth or something after or before. But the great thing about that is that he's, I mean, not practicing the Buddhist teaching or studying the Buddhist teaching, but he derived a lot of peace and psychological benefit just from not being shut up from the idea that there is the afterlife. So the question is, what is, to what do you attribute, Delson, the benefit of um, even being open to the possibility of rebirth and the, and the benefits of that? So when you, yeah, this is a good question. And actually, um, I know of some people who have had near-death experiences, like you've mentioned, and they've seen for themselves that indeed there's an experience outside of just this mundane existence or, you know, they've been connected with other beings or their ancestors or whatever it is. And that does indeed bring up a lot of joy in their minds. Of course, that depends. I mean, if they've been very wholesome, then that's going to lead them to there. But if they've been, uh, let's say, unwholesome, for some people, they experience the opposite of that. But then there too, they're kind of motivated. And they say, oh, there might be a hell. There might be a rebirth 
where I would be beholden to my bad actions. And that might start to change them into wanting to be wholesome and wanting to uh, generate better actions and being a better, kinder person to people. So the psychological benefit of that really is not necessarily just the belief in it, because the belief is one thing, but the understanding that it actually takes you to the other understanding, which is the, you know, that there is uh, consequences to my actions. So it starts to make you somebody who is more mindful of their actions. It starts to make you um, more mindful of the things that you do, the things that you say, uh, how you interact with people. And, you know, even the Buddha has talked about this and he said, let's say there is no other life. Let's say there is no other existence, just for the sake of argument. The fact is, if we have been wholesome throughout our lives, we build up a certain kind of reputation in this life alone, right? That this is a person that I can trust. This is an ethical person. This is a moral person. This is somebody that I can deal with and so on. And at the end of my life, I will look back and I'll say, I did lead a good life. That in itself is the beauty of being virtuous, of being wholesome. But you add that other layer of the potential of rebirth to happen, then there is another degree of happiness, which is that now, because of my past good actions, I'm going into a new existence that is possibly, potentially better than this. So these can be motivating factors, right? The belief of rebirth or the belief of other existences can be motivating factors for people to be a good person, to essentially follow the precepts. To that extent, they are useful, right? But the ultimate understanding is to transcend even all of that. Hi, Delson. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I had this question that if some person experiences stream entry, you know, going forward, if they don't practice, you know, in the next life or, you know, uh, if there are subsequent lives, do they know that they have attained it? And is it like a passive process which leads ultimately to Nibbana? Or is there some active uh, stuff going on, like they have insights or they need to do some other work to attain it? Yeah. This is... Yeah. So somebody who's become a stream enterer. So the idea of somebody who's a stream enterer is they will have up to seven lifetimes before they attain final Nibbana but they could have up to three lifetimes or maybe just one more lifetime. Now, in some cases, in, in these cases where somebody is a stream enterer and they're born a stream enterer, it's not necessary that they know that they're stream enterer. However, uh, you will see that early on in their life, and this is, this is basically, um, you know, based on the experience of others. So it's not necessarily in the suttas. But if somebody is a stream enterer, you will see that early on in their life, they have a very uh, keen interest in, um, you know, the spiritual arts. They're, they're very keen in meditation. They're not interested necessarily in what's going on around them in terms of materialism and, and you know, trying to make a big name for themselves and all of this other stuff. Uh, they're more interested in the inner world. They're more interested in that. Also, there can be situations where when they do see for themselves the idea of a personal self, they don't subscribe to that idea. They've never subscribed to that idea. And they're more like, they don't necessarily say that's an impersonal process, but they realize that they don't take things personally in that way. So um, once they're reintroduced to the Dhamma, they might confirm for themselves that, in fact, I've already gone through this process Right? So they, for themselves, can say, okay, possibly I'm a stream enter. But even if that's the case, stream enter is great. But you know what's even better? Once returner. And you know what's even better than that? A non-returner. And you know what's better than even that? Full, full arahatship. So it doesn't matter. What really matters is when you do come to the Dhamma, how do you interact with it? You might quickly pick it up. Right. And it all just makes sense to you. 
right? In any case, you still continue to exercise the same facets of the Eightfold Path, continue to experience Nibbana and so on. So no meditation is required after that? No meditation required after that? After, say, stream entry. It'll happen automatically. Oh, no, of course you need meditation. You need meditation all the way up to Arahatship. And uh, even Arahats uh, are said to continue to meditate. Not because they have to, but it's a good uh, it's a good place to be in, to meditate. So you need meditation all the time, every time. Del Hi, Delson. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask about, you were talking about it, the development of intuition. And I, I think that as we develop it, it's a gradual development. I mean, it's not something that just you have it. <laughs> so there's this yeah. period where you you intuitively respond appropriately to a situation and then or not maybe you intuitively inappropriately <laughs> respond but there's this reflective quality that comes in after the experience and sometimes maybe you've done something that you're like really <laughs> that was the right thing to do and yet somewhere there's a, a knowing that it was okay it was the right thing even though mm. maybe it's against the rules or mm. something because intuition seems a little bit beyond the rules like the rules are handy to know okay don't kill but at some point it's sort of beyond that i mean the way I, yeah yeah, the way I would look at it is when we look back on certain decisions that we've made, uh, it seems like it was the right thing to do because it somehow led to the appropriate situation or the place that we want to be in. I mean, you could say that that's, you know, prior intuition, but I think the way to look at it is, you know, when we look at karma, there's so many streams. Uh, there's so many different um, pathways that can be taken to lead into that situation. That's another way of looking at it. But when you talk about intuition, it does go beyond the thinking mind. It goes beyond the conceptual mind. It goes beyond, you know, that which is conditioned. Um, but intuition will still have that layer of making sure that it's appropriate enough that it doesn't cause harm. It doesn't mean to cause harm. It doesn't intend to cause harm one way or the other. So it will not cause us to intentionally say something that could be harmful to another. Because we can say something and we don't have any intention to be harmful, harm, you know, like being aggressive towards someone or saying something that hurts their feelings. That part they're responsible for. And so in that sense, yeah, it does transcend that. But it's still tries to be, it is within the confines of making sure that there's no intention to harm or to cheat or to lie and so on. So in the aftermath, the on the reflecting, the value, what, what you would one would do is investigate that. Whether investigate that, yes, right. So the decision that I took or the choice I made in that moment, what was it motivated by? You know, where did it come from? And, you know, was there maybe another choice that could have taken me to the same place? So that's also the investigation into, you know, was could there have been a better way? If not, then that was probably the best, best way to deal with the situation that would have led to this particular moment. It, it's even a little tricky because in this second, maybe there's a moment of harm, but then in this next few moments, it it turns out really good. So yeah. was that a good? <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So that's where we have to look back and say, do do I have an intention to be harmful there? Or was it unintentionally harmful to that person? 
but ultimately, you know, for example, the decision to um, leave somebody or the decision to, you know, say something to someone because it's needed in that moment. Uh, but we can't be responsible for how they feel. Only they can be responsible for how they feel. But we know that we have to say it in order to come out of the situation. Or we know that we have to leave them in order to find a better outcome. Right. So in those situations, we're not motivated by any kind of ill intentions. We're just motivated by trying to free ourselves, liberate ourselves from that. And so when we look back and we see, okay, it might have seemed harmful in that moment. But possibly when we look back, yes, that person might have felt harmed. That person might have felt like we were being unjust, whatever it was. But ultimately, it was the best outcome for them too, right? So for them too, it was like, oh, yeah, that was good. That was fine. I'm I'm a better person for that to have happened. It's awfully complicated because by when? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> And then it keeps going. That's it's, yeah. That's that's why the Buddha said. I mean, we try to look at karma in all those ways. It is a literal mind blower. So best to just work in the present moment. Yeah. Thank you. Who else do we have? I have a question, Dawson. Yes. First of all, thank you for the talk. Uh, this is about the 6R. Uh, the tension that happens and uh, we release the tension. I know, uh, I think in the, we mentioned it's because of the craving we see the tension. So is it that we are catching it after the craving arises and we are stopping the becoming? Or is it just that we are holding, catching the defilements and preventing the craving? I'm trying to... Maybe I'm trying to be very granular as to where it fits in the dependent origination uh, links. If you can elaborate there, that would be very helpful. The craving is the cause of tension, but craving is also tension. So craving can be identified by tension and identified as tension. And so we are catching it. Oh, so craving and tension are the same thing, and we let go of the craving, so we let go of the becoming then. Right. Okay. But so we have to get to a point where we feel no tension then at all. Right. And then uh, you can even become more granular, since we're, we're talking about this, and we can notice just before the tension arises, what is the intention behind it? What are the um, underlying tendencies that come up? And then we can choose to let go of those two before it goes into full-blown craving, before it becomes, you know, complete suffering. Thank you. Hi, Delson. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, you know, so in the process of meditation, sometimes we see that there's no agency. Things happen by themselves. I mean, there's no free will per se, right? For example, in walking meditation, uh, you might always be putting your left foot forward, right? And then mm -hmm. you kind of see that, and then you realize that you are actually creating the narration that, you know, you move this foot forward. So what is the, you know, is there any free will per se? It's, or is it free will only if you are mindful enough? So there is no free will. There is a conditioned intention that arises, right? So when we talk about free will, what we're saying, you know, first of all, the word, the, the, the phrase free will has so many different connotations. It can give rise to the idea of determinism, predeterminism, you know, all of these different ways of looking at it. But let's just simplify it and understand that in every given moment, there is a choice presented. And however the chain of reactions that have arisen, right, however they arise, will give some kind of automatic or almost automated inclination towards a particular choice. 
And this is where then, you know, Venerable Metananda uh, would say you have what's known as free won't. You always have the choice in every given moment to notice that that energy of, you know, continuous reactions that now come and project into wanting to take this choice. And then the utilization of seeing that and saying, no, I'm choosing not to do that, letting go of that and going to, let's say, from the unwholesome to the wholesome. In that, there is the free won't. There is the ability to say, I won't do this, right? And you could say that that's free will, but actually no, because that's conditioned by understanding the Dhamma, being introduced to the Dhamma, right? So there's always conditions that are going on. But if we say there's no free will, there can be the misunderstanding, then that means that there is no meaning to the actions that we're taking. But we're not saying that either. We're saying that every action that is being taken is a consequence of previous intentions, which are consequences of previous habitual tendencies, which are consequences of previous choices and formations and so on. And that's continuing to be conditioned until you come out of that and you experience the unconditioned, the absolute, which is Nibbana. So to that extent, that is outside the scope of even seeing that as free will or not free will. All it is, is it's just conditions arising and conditioning other conditions and so on. Uh, so the only way to have free want is to be mindful then. That's right. Okay. That's the attention rooted in reality. That's what I call it, but that's the yoni so manisikara. That is the, the proper attention being given to the moment and understanding what is present and then that's why I say there's also the, the react versus respond, right? When you go to a, a choice automatically, you're reacting. The mind is reacting based on previous information and the chain reactions. But when it's responding, because of that mindfulness, because of that attention, you're taking a pause for a few moments, making the mind collected, and then being able to then discern what choice should be made. And therefore, then that free want comes about. Delson, another question. Um, there's right view, but then uh, it is said that the Arahant also has right knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and to my mind, they sound a little bit separate in both. So, why, why would there be a distinction? The right knowledge would be like a full accomplishment of the right view or or how is that understood? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll actually go more in detail later on, but right knowledge. So we have two actually, right knowledge and right liberation. So right knowledge comes from the word samanyana, that's right insight. So that knowledge or that wisdom is the full um, understanding, the full observation, the full experience, the full unbridled, unadulterated experience of seeing all facets of dependent origination. That is what right knowledge is, which then informs the establishing of, you know, the super mundane right view. Go ahead. That then is connected to the, like the power of wisdom or the, or the faculty for yeah. wisdom, but but like 100% full on. So in that way, they are connected. That's right. I have a question. Uh, and yes. Thank you very, thank you very much, Delson, for, um, for um, speaking with us today. My question is around um, when one is going in meditation, through this six R process and letting go of the thoughts that arise, the distractions and so on, uh, presumably letting go of the sort of the attachment to craving. Is there a point where one is moving? I've heard it said that at that point of moving through the links of uh, dependent origination to closer in the direction of ignorance. Um, so I'm not really sure, like my experience is letting go of the thoughts, letting go of the craving, but as, as one progresses into deeper jhanas or um, you know the higher uh, rupa jhanas there, it changes. And I'm just wondering what exactly is going on there. Is it craving that we're letting go of? Or are there other aspects? 
Yeah, I think the way to look at it is when you when you see um uh, when you see like different facets of craving, you're seeing them because your mind becomes more and more collected as you get into higher levels. So when you get into the Arupas, you're actually starting to look at consciousness, right? In infinite consciousness. You're starting to see how the arising and passing away of consciousness happens. Uh, when you go into neither perception or non-perception, you're actually going, starting to go into the level of formations and starting to see the proto-thoughts. That's what I call formations, the proto-thoughts. Just before the thought can be fully formed, you're able to let go of them. You're able to just like, they just cascade out, you know, instead of like becoming fully formed into a thought, they they are basically just let go of. And so it is in that sense, going reversing through dependent origination all the way towards ignorance but in this case ignorance when you experience uh or when you go have you know when your mind experiences the cessation of perception feeling and consciousness it replaces the ignorance and in that moment when the mind comes out instead of ignorance being there it's nibbana and when it's nibbana in that moment Whoever is experiencing that for that split moment, their mind is free completely. Their mind is the mind of an arhat. But what happens is once you start to see the links and then you have attachment to, oh, that was an experience. I wonder what that was. The sense of self comes up. The craving comes up. Then all of that then comes, comes back through the next arising of the links. And so whatever is let go is let go of, but whatever is remaining is remaining. So... For the mind of the arahat, how they get to that is they experience nibbana and nothing but nibbana. They don't take anything personally. They don't attach any sense of self to any of that. Therefore, all the fuel is then burned out. Just to follow up question around that, um, just wondering about um, that process of dropping some of the fetters in touching the nibbana element how do you know that that has taken place? You'll only know through a um, long period of experimentation and putting yourself in different situations to see if craving is still arising, to see if mental agitation is arising, to see if the mind is getting irritated by something and so on. So you have to you know, expose the mind back into the world and see how it's taking it. Thank you for all your sharing. And I just have two related questions. It's so fun to to be here and be a learner. And and I still am just wondering, is the whole point of ultimately being a non-returner because that would mean you then no longer contribute to harm? And then secondly, if you have, you know, created karma and created harm or violated a precept. Is there anything in this life that would disable its virulence for others? Because when when we harm another, it sets in motion their harm for another and so on and so on. You know, is loving kindness meditation a way to disrupt that? Or do we just need to surrender and trust in the beauty and benevolence of karma as we let it work its, you know, wonders in our growth? Yeah, so first I'll just say, you know, I mean, the ultimate should be, the ultimate goal should be to attain arahatship. Because even if you become a non-returner, there's still, you're not coming back into the sensual realms. But in the cosmology, you would go to another realm where you're there for many, 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 many eons before you become an arahat over there. So, yes, it's a wonderful goal to have if you want to be a non-returner. But I'd say, why not just go all the way? You know, just try to become <laughs> an arahat as fast as possible. But um Aside from that, um, you know, your question about, you know, the, the, the past actions that were taken prior to full awakening. So that might set up a whole series of chain reactions, but you, the reactions that happen are primarily being experienced by the, by, you know, the mind that had those intentions. So, Yes, it might harm others, and that's their karma to experience that. But how they choose to then behave accordingly will be their future karma. 
But now, let's say the arahat has put a stop to all of that. So whatever they're experiencing as an effect of what they've done in the past, they're just dealing with it right there in that moment. And so they're only here in this moment, allowing things to happen. There was, you know, Moglana, for example, the story of Moglana is a really good one because, you know, he, in, in, a, in his story, in a previous life, he had done some terrible things. I mean, he had done what was known as one of the five immediately effective karmas, which is killing one's parents. He did that and he experienced, um, you know, the effects of that by going into the lower realms and all of that. But that karma was so great that even a small stain of that was still there to be experienced, even as an arhat. At what, at what point it was basically what, you know, killed his body, which resulted in or which came about from, um, you know, people basically bashing him. He tried to evade them using his psychic faculties, but that ran out. Again, that was karma. And then he had to be beholden to that experience. Now, the question is, OK, they that was done. But what about those people who beat him up? Now, they're experiencing their karma. They could have chosen not to do that so that was their intention that wasn't that because he had to experience that karma that they had to do it causes and conditions were such that they came and intersected with each other right that's the beauty of this matrix things come together in such a way to fulfill certain kinds of karmic ripening mm -hmm. but if you allow that ripening to happen and don't react to it that's it that's the end of it right there and then so our goal should be to always be mindful of the feeling, that is to say, the experiences that we're having in this moment and noticing how we're taking it. If we start to take it personally, then there is repercussion of possible further renewal of that karma. But if we choose to see it as an impersonal process and detach from that, right, and not be affected by that, by using the six stars, using you know loving kindness and so on, then none of that will arise again. Now you talked about like the virulence of that karma, any particular karma. The Buddha has talked about this as well. He he gave an example of you know you take you take like a tablespoon of salt and you put it in a glass of water, and you drink that water, it will be salty. But somebody who has attained stream entry or somebody who's practicing loving kindness for that matter, when they do that, you take that same tablespoon of salt and you put it in a gallon of water. It's not as salty anymore. So the idea is when you experience the first level of awakening or even when you're treating that experience with loving kindness, it dilutes the effect of that particular karma. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello. Can I ask something? Yes. Okay. So, um, when you have the realization that it, the self is uh, is not a thing, it's not real. So, um, how you interact with the other person because. At one moment, you understand that they don't contain the self. So to whom, to what you, you send love and kindness? To processes, to conditions, to... Because at one moment, the mind senses of something is not quite okay. It's empty you sent in emptiness so it's okay my understanding and how to uh, at one moment i try to convince myself that uh, around me are many persons and i send loving kindness and kindness to them but uh, something is not right i think this is my Feeling. Something is not right. In what way? Uh, it's not um, true. Let's say, in accordance with the dam. 
Can you elaborate what you mean by that? So I understand Anata. So it's applying to me and also it's applying to others. So to whom you sent loving kindness? It's not a self mm -hmm. outside to whom you are, you wish happiness or... Uh, yeah. Sometimes I can, sometimes I cannot. Okay. So first let's understand Anata. Right. So the word anatta is actually coming from two things. An means not. And atta means self in Pali, Atman. And the idea is that not that there is no self. This is really important to understand. Many times the Buddha has been asked, is there a self or is there no self? And in either case, he has said nothing. He has chosen to remain silent because... If he were to say that there is no self, what is that self that knows that there is no self, right? And then if you were to say that there is a self, then you're going to start to take things personally. So instead, what he talked about was anatta, which means that which is not self. Why does he say that? Because he understood the Indian mindset at that time, which at the time of the Vedas and the Upanishads and so on, there was this idea of a self, an Atman, who was the seer behind the scene, the hearer behind the herd, the, 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 the one who was experiencing everything. And that this experiencer was permanent and was the source of happiness and therefore the self. So the Buddha said, okay, fine, let's say that you're saying that this is the case. Let's take all of our facets of existence and taking this as the touchstone, let's put that and as tri on trial and see if that matches that idealistic self. That's why then he says all of the aggregates that we see, they're impermanent. That which is impermanent is liable to cause suffering. Therefore, it cannot be seen as self. So what we're saying is that which is not self. Loving kindness also is not self. The intention to send out loving kindness also is not self. Right? Whether or not they've experienced or not, that's not our concern. The exercise to send out loving kindness is not for their sake. The exercise to send out compassion is not for the other person's sake. It's to purify the mind it's to engage the mind into a level of collectedness so whether or not they're receiving it doesn't matter it should not matter to you what should matter is are you experiencing loving kindness and are you is your mind having loving kindness for others that's it so let's not confuse this idea of anatta as no self let's understand anatta means we're letting go of all processes that are conditioned and impermanent. And we're letting go of them and saying that they are not me, not mine, not myself. And that the loving kindness that we're experiencing is essentially for the purification of our own mind. Hello, Nelson. Thank you for uh, yes. the live talk. Uh, I have a quick question regarding the relaxed step. <clears throat> so sometimes we have this uh, uh, very strong hydrogen that come up, let's say some strong desire where the mind just uh, uh, grasps so tight, right? That no matter how much we relax, it just doesn't uh, want to let go. I think the suttas refers to this as the mind gets caught up. Uh, or gets entangled, mm -hmm. so it grasps, sees a sense object, or it grasps uh, the sign and features, and just and it gets 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 entangled in this proliferation. And when I do the relaxed step, so if I I see the intention just arising, and I do the the relaxed step, then I feel the relief immediately, right? And the mind is going. It's that sense of oh, I, I overcome this. But sometimes the the tendency of the mind to maybe it has some. Uh, uh, very strong habitual tendencies that were probably enforced through a lot of, of action that the mind just doesn't want to let go. I don't feel that relief and that is still feel that uh, 
uh, the sensations, right? That that craving in the body. Now, every time I apply, even then, if I apply the, the relax, I do feel that diminishing a bit, but there is still there and it's really bothering me. So do you uh, have any advice uh, of what can one do in terms of what you call craving interventions? Uh, <laughs> you said that uh, six R is like craving intervention, right? Which works most of the time, but sometimes when the mind gets caught up in that proliferation, it's very hard to calm down uh, those formations. So maybe you have some advice regarding that. But they had the best advice, which was laugh at it. Laugh at the whole thing, you know? Just make it a joke, like, oh man, this mind, look at it, there it goes again, getting caught up, you know, trying to do things, just laugh at it, make it a joke, make it fun. We always oftentimes forget that this is supposed to be a fun process. So that, and then secondly, take a break from it, you know, just take a break from it and just go out and do something else and then come back to the practice and see how your mind is. I have a okay. okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm curious, thank you for this talk, by the way. How does the detached offering to the bhikkhus and bhikkhanis in the Sangha pass merit on? You described, you know, a lot of people in my world who are not followers, not, not acquainted with the Dhamma, perhaps only personally, I fear may have become hungry ghosts. I'd be very interested in how I might help them as you describe. Yeah. So the mechanism of how that works, you know, that's 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 something that is um that's working at a different level, let's say. Uh you know when we which we'll do at the end of this whole session, we're going to be doing what's known as sharing merit. So this sharing merit that we do is essentially sending loving kindness to all beings. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free of suffering and, and so on and so forth. That is wonderful. But the idea, the mechanism behind this is that what we're saying is with the bhikkhus. So this is, again, going back to the exposition of offerings that I was talking about earlier. When you give to a certain level of mindset, that mindset, let's say it's somebody who is a stream enter or... Um, a once returner or whatever, their, their receiving of it purifies the gift and the merit of that then can be transferred on to whoever it is that you want to. You can dedicate that merit. But as to how that mechanism works and why it works and so on, it's just like karma. You try to fathom it, you know. And so that's why you could take it up on faith and say, you know, I really w wish that this merit that I'm receiving by giving is dedicated to this particular individual and that this liberates them from that existence and takes them to a higher existence. So to that level, you could say it's on faith, but also it purifies your own mind. It's like, okay, you have a certain level of, ah, I'm doing this for that person. And my hope, my faith is that it will genuinely affect them in a positive manner. So I think we'll just take a few more questions. Who's got a juicy one? Well, I have another one. Um, somehow Delson's gone. Where's Delson? <laughs> I, I know, but I just don't see him. So let me fix that. I'm seeing you, David. Um, Delson, I don't know if you've run into IFS therapy, internal family systems therapy. I'm running into it a lot in my work. And what it is, is a, it's a way of describing the at different aspects of the um, personality, really. Like you get, you have a trauma and you, um, maybe you have a responding voice in the mind so there's these different voices and um 
it, it, I'm not really feeling skilled in how to deal with that as it, or how to align it with my, with the Dharma. It, it seems, um, I mean, we do, we all have these aspects, our little girl aspect, our big strong person, you know, all these different aspects, but I, I'm not sure how to meet someone who's, and sometimes there's even entities that are, um, take over the mind in that, in that way. And I, I'm wondering if you could speak to it at all, or maybe it's too off topic. Yeah, I'm not too I'm not too familiar with uh, IFS, uh, but I've been I've been hearing a, about this through the community in my different retreats when people you know come to interviews, and they've done it for themselves or you know, they've explored it and all of that. So I can't really necessarily comment on you know how we could reconcile um, that system with the Dhamma, but I think uh, what you're talking about there, where you know you take on different identities, I'm not sure if that's something that you explore in IFS. Um, but if it is, that's probably a first way of introducing the Dhamma, because that is what it is, right? With Anatta, is we take up different kinds of identities, or the mind has a tendency to say, in this moment, I am this big macho person. In this moment, you know, I'm so and so, and that's all conditioned by. Uh, our previous experiences, you know, like how we deal with how we attach ourselves in different relationships is also dependent upon the trauma that we've experienced, right? We can be uh, too anxious or we can be avoidant or we could be this or that or whatever it is. Um, so looking at that and understanding everything as a series of causes and conditions might be the first stepping stone along with understanding the different identities dependent upon those previous conditions, whether they're trauma based or otherwise. Well, do you think there's value in exploring that? I mean, I, I don't, I don't really, it all comes down to the same point of, of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I have another question, Delson. Regarding, let's say, the Buddha as a teacher, right? So there is all these different pedagogical approaches he may take, right? Um, and sometimes I wonder if, let's say, uh, they're part of like a more curricular, right? He, he may teach, you know, um, the factors of enlightenment and the faculties. Mm -hmm. But apparently there is a kind of the temperament of the person, the quality of the mind of the person, it's more coinciding with a certain way of relating, right? So, so the different ways of po pointing the picture come up as a like a, the consonant approach for that yeah. mind. So, for example, yeah. you have uh, the five aggregates or the six sense bases, and you can look at the same process in what, looking at the aggregates or looking at six sense bases. You're kind of looking at the same thing. But the same mm -hmm. thing happens right with the faculties and with the path. So there is this, um, but the and, and related to the thing of the right view, there's the noble eightfold path appears to be um, uh, a more complete kind of thing. But again, what could make the argument that the faculties, like the five faculties, are also another way of seeing the whole picture? So I was yeah. wondering, comment about that. So, so the way to look at this whole experience, first of all, when the Buddha was teaching, yeah, in that moment, he was teaching according to that person's mindset. So I would, I would um, say that these lists that we have within Buddhism, whether it's the um, enlightenment factors, the five aggregates, the six sense bases, uh, the five faculties, the five powers, you know, basically the 37 requisites, that's the ultimate, like that's the whole package. The 37 requisites for enlightenment, right? That includes all of that that you've mentioned. The four foundations of mindfulness and so on. So all of that is, I would say, something that the bhikkhus after the time of the Buddha, in, a, in other words, post his Parinibbana at different councils, may have created these lists 
as a way of uh, compiling all of his teachings. Because in that moment, he was just teaching whatever he was teaching, whether it was the enlightenment factors, whether it was the four foundations of mindfulness, whether it was the five aggregates or the six sense bases, it was all dependent upon his students, whoever was there that was listening. So, but what's interesting about that is that every sutta that you read is essentially an elaboration of the four noble truths. That's all it is. Either he's talking about the first two noble truths, which is suffering and how the suffering arise, so dependent origination, or he's talking about the cessation of suffering and how to let go of that. So using the four noble, uh, four foundations of mindfulness, uh, you know, letting go of the six sense spaces, the eightfold path, and so on and so forth. So if you were to boil it down to one thing, it's just the four noble truths. He started off with the four noble truths, then every other discourse after that is just an elaboration of his first sermon. That's it. And he himself has said, I teach two things, suffering and the end of suffering. So it's, it's like the elephant's footprint uh, simile, right? Is, is, is that, uh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Hi, Delson. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so even after, uh, say, for instance, for a stream enter, what happens is that the greed and hatred is not ended. In fact, it's not even attrition. So, I mean, they do create a lot of karma because of, you know, habitual behaviors and stuff. Even though there is free bond, it's not always available to exercise, right? Mm -hmm. They do kind of behave, you know. So can this derail the process of uh, you know final unwinding or you know is it okay to so uh you know mahanama had this question too uh with the buddha and the buddha saw him and he said what are you so stressed about and mahanama said you know uh if i'm a stream enterer does that mean that there's a possibility for me to you know unwind this and then go back into like a, a lower realm or something and the Buddha said, no, because once you become a stream enter, what happens is all the different karmas that are related to you going into a lower realm are, are, um, are mitigated, for lack of a better word. In other words, the karmas are still there. But using that same analogy that I used before that the Buddha had talked about, which is that salt, you know, in... The glass of water is different than the salt in the gallon of water. So that's what happens when you become a stream enter. You're still beholden to your karma, just like an arahat is. But because you, as a stream enter, you have the dhamma, you can let go of it a little bit. You can let go of, let go of it a little bit more when you're a once returner and so on. Sometimes you forget about it. And so there's lack of mindfulness. You will have lack of mindfulness. There will be lack of mindfulness of greed, hatred, and delusion for the stream enter. There will be lack of mindfulness of that for the once returner. There will be lack of mindfulness for delusion for the non-returner. But there won't be any lack of mindfulness for the arahant. So the mindfulness is continually perfected or cultivated until it's perfected at the final stage. Thanks. Um, I have a question. Uh, hi, Delson. Um, hi. Uh, about uh, so so there's the the uh, the process. Let's say for for someone who's a stream mentor or or a sakadagami or something, and there's still um, a lot of uh, you know trauma based or other based uh, personality uh, stuff, uh, and that that is you know clearly like very very uh, visceral suffering, very very um, you know causes obstacles in the life and so on and and and, and dis difficulties for others and so on so i'm curious of uh, there's a there's the path of of you know go for our hardship and practice for our hardship uh, and at the same time though uh a lot of people do, you know have complementary therapy that they do to work out these yeah. other things to make the life more wholesome and so on so i wonder if you could just speak a little bit about that that sort of uh, the balance of how much to worry about fixing this personality versus just like 
get the thing over with and and let the chips fall where they may kind of thing yeah i mean definitely we don't want to spiritually bypass anything definitely not so what i would say is um with these complementary therapies that's the that's the main thing the, the, the therapies ought to be complementary which means they don't result in you taking things personally they don't result in you still having your suffering there are therapies that might be in alignment that might fit with you know what we're doing here with the six r's uh what we're doing with in terms of the dhamma and the eightfold path one of them i would say and i always talk about is cbt cognitive behavioral therapy or rebt rational emotive behavioral therapy because what it is is it's essentially looking at all of your different cognitive distortions and noticing how it is that you take things personally or how it is you magnify things out of proportion or how it is that whatever it is and so these cognitive distortions are likened to, in the Dhamma, the upakilesas, right? That is to say, the defilements of greed, hatred, delusion, jealousy, this, that, or the other. And what you do in CBT is you notice that, you rationalize it by saying, this is not who I am, let it go, or however you do it. And you replace it with something that's wholesome. Same thing that you're doing in the six R's. So I would say that you can always, always use complement, complementary things that help you in your practice and help you to let go of suffering. Right? Even the Buddha has talked about anything that you do that is letting you let go, that is allowing you to let go and see for yourself can be understood as being part of the Dhamma or helping you get to the Dhamma. Thank you. That's very helpful.